North Carolina State. Jim Valvano said, I believe in dreams. He feels they're a team of destiny. We have one practice every year where they come up on a court. There's no balls. There's no drills. All we do is practice cutting the net down. It's true. Well, I have a scissor. I have a gold scissor. They, we carry each other up. We cut the net. They hook me up. I cut the last one. We do that. 52 all. This is for the national championship. That's my dream. Cutting the net down. And I am going to dream my dream. Yeah. Got it drive to the basket. It's down to seven seconds. You can see the time. Wittenberg on it's a long way. Oh! And won it on the dunk. Every single day, in every walk of life, ordinary people do extraordinary things. Ordinary people accomplish extraordinary things. What's up, guys? Um, it's been a minute. Um, I've been just kind of distracted. Uh, it's March. March Madness. Uh, every time, this time of year, uh, the end of the basketball season, college basketball season, you go into the ACC tournament, you go into the NCAA tournament. Like, my attention is all focused on that. <laughs> Uh, and work, and uh, that's about it. Um, still managed to find some time to spend some records here and there, buy some records here and there, but just haven't really uh, haven't really had the time to make any videos. So thought I'd pop on here really quick. So at the end of last year, I did uh, a purge of around fifty to sixty records. Uh, it was right around Christmas time. Not long before that, maybe even back in the fall. I did another purge of about the same number. Um, did just trade ins on both. I would say at the beginning of 2019, I had about anywhere from 22 to 2300 records. That was where my collection was. Over the years, ever since then, I've been trying to purge more and more. I've made some purge videos in the past showing what I'm purging and getting rid of and talking about that type of stuff. I have come to grips with the fact that I am just overwhelmed by a large record collection. So, you know, all you folks that have like 4,000 plus records or whatever, you know, and you're saying, why well, you don't need to purge. You don't need to limit yourself to a certain number. I mean, whatever. It's fine. I get it. It's nice to have like a big record collection that you can just pull a record out at any time, like it's a library, you know, and I, I get that. That's really cool and all. But you're not listening to all those records, guys. You're not. It's just a fact. And there are a lot of records that you're buying and you're maybe spinning them once and then they're hopping up on the shelf and then they're never coming back off again. It's just the truth. Uh, we do not have enough time in our days to listen to every single record that we own multiple times over and over and over again. I'm sorry, we don't, even if we're retired. So get that in your thick vinyl skull. I loved seeing James Buttery's tour, record room tour recently, and him talking about how he only really has like 1,300 records now, you know? And it seems like he's really kind of hyper-focusing down on a collection of records that he truly wants, like the records that he really wants the most. And that's really what I'm, I'm trying to work towards as well. All of my collection is in Discogs now. I can't remember the exact number. I think it's around, it's under 1700. It might be a little more than 1650, I think, is where I'm at. And I'm probably gonna be getting rid of more records throughout the year. Um, and then even into the next year and into the next year at the same time, slowing down what I'm buying. Uh, and that's just, that's the new path for me. Um, and you can all mark it down and come back years later with an I told you so or whatever, but I can tell you it's, it's not gonna happen. Will the record collection maybe stay at around this size? There's a high likelihood of that. Is it gonna get any bigger? Maybe. I don't know. I, I, I'm not going to rule that out. It could get back up to 2,000 records as far as I know. But I just know that generally I kind of feel overwhelmed by that happening. So if it does happen, it will be with uh, more thought and consideration 
going into what is coming into into my collection we'll, we'll, we'll put it that way so I actually will give like a quick little tour too of what my record collection kind of looks like right now you're not gonna get a room tour because this room is an absolute mess but I'll go through and give you a little bit of tour of a tour of 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 uh, the record collection as a whole okay so the record collection as a whole basically uh, we have all the box sets up here okay those are all the box sets then uh, from here we have like a 16 hole Ikea Kallax or whatever you want to call it uh, and then I have one extra one stacked on top so from here all the way down you basically have a through z of rock and i have punk in here i have uh, the very few metal records that i have left in here hard rock alternative indie rock uh you're any kind of genre of rock right is in here uh down here are basically kind of new arrivals so as you see, plenty of rock and pop and whatever you want to call it. Also, the very few electronic records that I have, like Fortet and Daft Punk or like in here, you know, that type of electronic. Then right here, you have this one cube of um, all, this is all kind of like North Carolina focused stuff, like a flip box of North Carolina centric things. Not all of the bands that I own that are from North Carolina, but uh, a lot of them are in this flip box right here. Then I have this other uh, 12 hole calyx right here. And starting here, I have some compilations, Christmas, um, a couple of comedy records in there. Then I have uh, my MoFi records, and then I have hip hop the small collection of hip-hop that I still have on vinyl now. Then starting here, we get into international music and we have um, basically like German stuff, Kraut stuff uh, to start. And then you get into like some Latin American, South American, Central American music. Then in this next little section right here, you have a lot of African stuff. Uh, Fela's in there, some analog Africa comps and uh, other comps, but mostly all the African Zamrock and all of that jazz and funk is right in there. Then this next little pile next to it is I've started kind of like a new classical experimental kind of hard to define uh avant-garde experimental classical and classical section so even if the classical is not that out there it's still in there but uh that's what that is all right this cube is all donald bird don cherry alice coltrane john coltrane and miles davis these three cubes are all R&B, soul, and funk. Those four cubes are all Americana, country, alt-country, country rock, basically the twang section, anything with twang. And then in this last cube that's like half full, blues and gospel together. Okay, over here we have two... Uh, boxes flip boxes that have nothing but jazz in them so those are all my jazz records other than the ones that i just showed you the other thing i want to talk about is some gear stuff like i never talk about gear you know why because i know nothing about gear i am fucking clueless and you can ask anybody that i message um, or text about this stuff. I have no idea what I'm fucking doing. I just never have. I don't really care. My system, when I bought the current system that I have, I wanted it to be as simple as possible. I wanted to be able to just hook it up quickly and not worry about having too many parts 
you know, I bought a turntable that has a built-in preamp, so I didn't have to worry about buying an extra preamp and all this stuff. I um, Everything was new that I bought at the time. That just made more sense for me. I didn't want to go through a bunch of used gear and trying to figure out like why it wasn't working or how to fix it and all of that stuff. And more power to you guys. Like I'm really jealous of the folks that really do know a lot about gear and can like fix speakers and things like that and buy vintage shit and like restore it and stuff. I'm really jealous of you guys, but I'm just, that's never gonna be me, right? But I decided to upgrade my speakers. That was like a big thing for me. Um, I had some Cambridge Audio bookshelf speakers, which were nice. They sounded really, really good in my opinion. Um, but they were still kind of entry level. Clarity was like the big thing with those speakers. Like clarity was excellent, but they lacked uh, a substantial amount of bottom end. <laughs> anyway, so I wanted to get some floor standing speakers uh, and I ended up seeing that Klipsch had a sale back around Black Friday for their 800 RF speakers. Uh, they were basically 50% off. It was, you know, buy two, get one free. Uh, so I jumped on that and I've been really happy with those. It took me a minute to kind of get used to the amount of bass that I was getting just from the difference in speaker size and everything like that. But I, I like that sound. And so it just took me a little bit for my ears to just kind of like acclimate to that, but I'm thoroughly enjoying them. They sound really, really good. The other thing that I ran into was I started having some issues with my cart or stylus or both. In the 10 years that I've owned this turntable that I have, it's a Denon turntable. I bought it and it came with a, a 2M Red, Ortofon 2M Red. But as I've bought new carts or replacements and stylus replacements, it's been the Ortofon 2M Red. Well, I, I don't know what happened. I think the kids were messing around with the turntable one day or something, but the stylus definitely, there was definitely some worn issues on the stylus. So I researched some other carts and I looked at things that were comparable to the Ortofon based on cost, based on design, based on reviews. I settled on Samiko and the Pearl series, and I decided to get the Olympia. It was fantastic card. It was like super easy to install. I, it's just things like that that do it for me, right? Like I, I don't trust myself in installing a cart really. And so if I can get one where I can, where the screws go in the top, just things like that that make it easier, it sounds really great. But then all of a sudden after about four spin spinning sessions, I started to hear these really loud static pops, random loud static pops, and I had no idea what was going on. Almost every record that I pull off the shelf now, especially ones that I haven't listened to in a while, I will uh, clean. And so I don't know what was happening there with these loud static pops, and I couldn't figure it out, and I was researching, and I was asking people if they knew uh, what, what might be the issue. Happy to say that that quit. It just doesn't happen anymore. I've even tr gone back to the records that I heard it on. It doesn't, does, doesn't happen anymore. Uh, maybe it was the brush that I was using and the cleaning. I, I don't have a clue, <laughs> but it, it stopped and it sounds fantastic. I'm really happy with everything the way, the way that it is. I don't need a lot guys. Like I'm not an audiophile. So all of you audiophiles can leave me alone. Don't even go in the comments with bullshit down there. I don't care. I don't want to hear it. Uh, I like things simple. I like things easy for me. It's just about having a pleasurable record listening experience. It's improved with the changes that I've made and I feel good about them. And that's where we're at. So. So let's talk about a record. There's a band that I like a lot, that I liked a lot in the 2000s, that's been an inactive for some time. And it's a band called The Long Winters. And they just uh, reissued their entire discography. They have three 
LPs, three proper LPs and one EP. They put all of those out from the years, I think 2001 to 2006, maybe. When I Pretend to Fall, this is the one that I decided to buy out of all of the reissues. It came out in 2003. It was my favorite album by them at the time. And I also think that it's probably one of the more underrated records, if not the most underrated record that came out from that time period. I first learned about The Long Winters when I saw them open for The Decemberists around 2003 or four. The Decemberists were touring after their first two albums had come out and then they had released an EP called The Tain. Saw them open, uh, saw The Long Winters open for The Decemberists at Cat's Cradle in Carborough, North Carolina. It was a great show. The, the Long Winters were fantastic. And John Roderick, who is the lead singer, front man of the band, so charismatic, really funny, had incredible stage banner in between songs. Uh, his lyrics are outstanding. Uh, there's a, a bit of that humor in some of the lyrics. Uh, has just incredible attention to detail. Uh, a bit of a of a wordsmith, but in a in a in a strange way. Um, sometimes very nonsensical, but also could write great story songs as well. Uh, for the most part, there's no other way to categorize this other than indie rock. To me, it reminds me a lot of like the kind of the poppier numbers that came out of like the alternative music scene in the 90s, uh, in the early to mid 90s, the kind of stuff that would make it to the uh, those alternative radio uh, stations, you know, and, and get a lot of airplay. You know, a lot of that great, really catchy kind of pop rock, but also uh, touches of like Americana um, and folk. So The Long Winters started as pretty much a collaboration between John Roderick and Sean Nelson. Those of you might know Sean Nelson. He was uh, the front man of the band Harvey Danger. I believe John Roderick was touring with Harvey Danger back in the late 90s or whatever. And so they got together and the first Long Winters album was pretty much a collaboration between the two of them. This album is mostly, no, not mostly, it's it's all John Roderick. I think he co-wrote one song on here. Uh, Sean Nelson, though, still appears and does backing vocals. There's also, uh, there's a ton of guests on here. The more notable ones being uh, Peter Buck, Scott McCoy, uh, Chris Walla. Chris Walla had produced the first record, recorded and produced the first record. He also, he plays some guitars on here and um, gets some production credits as well. Chris Walla is from Death Cab for Cutie. I will say that these were kind of pricey. After taxes, this ended up being about 40 bucks. Uh, it's 2LP, but still. That was a little disappointing to see how, how expensive they were. But if anything that I've said about this record and this band is appealing to you, I might even try and get a sound sample in here. I would highly recommend checking out The Long Winters if you're unaware. So let me tell you a little bit about what is so exciting for me personally about March Madness right now. The NC State Wolfpack have made the Final Four. Uh, my dad went to NC State. I was born and raised in South Carolina, but my dad was born and raised in North Carolina. He raised me um, on everything, all things North Carolina. So grew up a big kind of a Wolfpack fan. Um, hops a little bit onto the Duke uh, bandwagon as well in the 90s, mostly out of a shared hatred for uh, North Carolina Tar Heels. I am what you call in the Carolinas, in North Carolina, I'm what you call an ABCer, anybody but Carolina. Um, so I love Duke basketball as well, but Duke basketball is really the only thing that I'm interested in as far as Duke is concerned. 
as far as other sports, when I cared about other sports, I was always a Wolfpack fan uh, through and through. So really stoked that NC State has made the Final Four. On top of that, uh, DJ Burns, who has kind of become one of the stars of the tournament, my, he went to my alma mater. Uh, I graduated from Winthrop University. He was the Big South Player of the Year when he was at Winthrop. Uh, so I was a big fan of his already and already well aware of him. And then he transferred to NC State, and I was super stoked about that. And here we are. He's leading the Wolfpack to the Final Four. But it's exciting times, guys, because this is like the first time NC State has made it since 1983, and that was the historic Cinderella run uh, that if you're a sports fan, everybody knows about the 83 Wolfpack. I was only five years old, so I don't remember it at all. <laughs> so this is really exciting for me to witness uh, NC State making it to the Final Four. It was very hard watching them play Duke to go to the Final Four. That was, a, uh, I've never felt like that before in my life. I felt like I had multiple personality disorder <laughs> um, watching that game. I'm glad it's over. Duke will be fine. They'll be back some other time. NC State never gets to this point and they might not get there again for a while. So yeah, just had to mention that, um, you know, go pack. I'm going to have uh, some other videos uh, coming up soon. I want to talk a little bit about some more soul and R&B records. I want to talk about new releases from 2024, some of the ones that I've bought so far this year. And um, yeah, I don't know. I might even have like a vinyl tag up my sleeve or some crazy shit like that. Who knows? But anyway, uh, hoping to get back in the flow here, making some videos again. And I uh, hope all you guys are doing well. Um, yeah, cheers. Digital gramophone makes no sense.